Greetings, everybody. I hope you're doing very well. This is going to be the first in a series of videos going over the writings of critical race theorists and other critical theories. A few months ago, James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose came out with their book, Cynical Theories, which I have and I'm looking forward to reading, but I decided before I read the critique of critical race theory, I should actually read critical race theory. And there's a whole list of books I'm going to do, how to be an anti-racist, critical race theory. Um, let's see what else what I got up there. Uh, uh, white guilt, uh, acting white, a couple others. But to start off those, I want to do with probably the most famous and influential, if not necessarily the largest, and that is White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism by Robin D'Angelo. Right here, a short little book. Number one New York Times bestseller right there. And, uh, you know, if you if you want to read it yourself, you obviously you can. It's pretty short. It's big text. There's lots of space. It took maybe a day and a half of light reading to finish it. Um, if you don't want to give her any money, though, you can just watch this video, I suppose. Much of this book I had heard reported by people like Lindsay. They quoted a lot of it. So it kind of felt familiar to read it, but I thought it was a good idea to read it myself. And I have marked the hell out of this. And so basically the premise here is that Racism exists everywhere. She defines racism in such a way as that it only is the, 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 the group in power that can have it. So it doesn't matter how racist a minority person is or a person of color is. If they're not in power, then that's not actually racism. That's just prejudice. You will call that prejudice, but it's not racism. Only white people can be racist. She doesn't really talk about then is it then possible for racism to exist in, say, some place like Uganda or Tanzania where black people are in power. Um, or, or Chinese people or Japanese people. Like a, Ch a Chinese person can't be racist in the United States, but they probably can be racist in China. She doesn't really wrestle with that at all. Um, but the idea is that racism is ubiquitous. It is foundational in every sense to which they say, she says Western society over and over and over again. And it's based on uh, Western society is based on racism and, and the theft of indigenous lands. Again, she doesn't really wrestle with the fact that theft of indigenous lands is just a ubiquitous thing that's happened everywhere in history. But the guilt is kind of squarely put in one group. Uh, and as someone like Thomas Sowell would point out, the irony when it comes to slavery is that slavery has been universal. And the one society that made a point to try and eliminate it, a very concerted point to try and eliminate it, is quote-unquote Western society. And yet that's the one society that gets all the blame. So that those are some of the problems with the book. But basically the, the idea is that everyone's racist. And then the premise is how... White people are fragile about that. White people are in denial about that. White people think that they're not racist when they actually are. And if you try and confront them about being racist, then they get upset and they you know, exhibit all of these characteristics, which she shows uh, are reflections of, of their guilt about being racist and their denial about being racist. And it's very interesting here. Basically, anytime anyone disagrees with her, her, her attitude isn't that she might be wrong or that they might have a point or that there might be legitimate reasons not to find her analysis convincing it's that they're actually secretly racist and they know it and they're just having all of these psychological defense mechanisms to help protect them from that it's really quite um, mendacious when she talks like that you know when she tells somebody that they're racist because uh, they disapprove of affirmative action or because uh, of they made a joke or whatever uh, then they say it's not racist it's not a big deal I'm married to a black woman or, or I have black children or whatever she'll just be like you're in denial. This is a teachable moment. I'm here to teach you about how racist you are and how dare you fucking resist. But anyway, I marked the hell out of this book and I just want to go through and do a lot of the quotes uh, and the kind of rib off of each one. Um, so let's see. So the first thing I actually quoted is in the foreword, which is not by D'Angelo. It's by Michael Eric Dyson, who is the king of uh, meaningless word salads, if you ever watch videos of him. Um, boop, 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 boop. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so this isn't necessarily, uh, well, yeah, this, this, this will go on some of the points in her, the rest of the book, but Dyson says, whiteness, like race, may not be true. It's not a biological, it's not a biologically heritable characteristic that has roots in physiological structures or in genes or chromosomes. So he's talking about, like, our skin color, whiteness is not genetic. Like it's not, it's not a physiological structures or in our genes or chromosomes, our whiteness. 
Like, and this is the thing is like racism, race is socially constructed. Uh, so um, it's real in that sense, but not in any actual sense. And this is kind of a running theme here is that uh, the only the only real thing in the world is racism, like all other sciences, hard sciences, soft sciences, histories, economics, physics, medicine, all these are not really real. They're all tainted by white supremacy and they're all invalid for that reason. The only thing that is real, like the only the only empirical, the only science, the only rationality that exists is critical theory. It's critical theorists are the only ones that make any sense. But this, I just thought, I mean, right off the bat, this is on, literally, this is not even page one, this is page X. It's, it's in the forward. We've got this coming out. Uh, so, now we're to the author's note. So, page X, I, I, I. So, this, uh, this is by D'Angelo, though, right? Yeah, okay. The United States, was, this is the very first paragraph of her writing. The United States was founded on the principle that all people are created equal, yet the nation began with an attempted genocide of indigenous people and the theft of their land. American wealth was built on the labor of kidnapped and enslaved Africans and their descendants. Women were denied the right to vote until 1920, and black women were denied access to the vote until 1965. The term identity politics refers to the focus on the barriers uh, specific groups face in their struggle for equality. We have yet to achieve our founding principle, but any gains we have made thus far have come through identity politics. So this is her kind of heading off the argument that she's resorting to identity politics. There's so much wrong in this statement. I mean, she even says, you know, the United States the Declaration of Independence says all men are created equal. So everyone knows that that is not something that was, you know, lived up to. But then also to ignore that that was a sentiment that was thought of, that, that, that people were thinking along that. Um, to, to say, well, we're just going to completely ignore that, and then the only thing that matters is the slavery aspect. And the other thing is that, say, the American wealth was built on slavery. I'll do more videos on this. I'm reading um, The Problem in the South right now uh, by uh, Mr. Helper, which will go into that more detail. But the idea that slavery built all the wealth in the United States. Now, I'm not going to say slavery was important. Slavery was a very important part of the economy, especially in the South, especially in the middle part and the later part of the 19th century. But it didn't build everything, all right? Most of the wealth in the United States is not derived from slaves. It never was. It isn't now. It isn't grown from slaves now. Uh, so the other thing I really don't like about this statement, I mean, there's a couple. Um, in terms of identity politics, refers to the focus on the barriers specific groups face in their struggle for equality. So here, do we, do we know, like, what what people are struggling for equality. This is the, the Marxist uh, taint in this uh, uh, um, uh, postmodern thought is the idea that, you know, if, if Native Americans or women or, or black people have grievances or if they're struggling, um, it's because they want equality. Well, I'm sure some of them will say that, but some of them probably would not say that. So equality is, she's kind of importing her, you know, uh, politics in here and saying they're fighting for this. She's speaking for them, which by her own terms is uh, incredibly racist and she should be fucking, I mean, she's, she's, she's written an entire book where basically she's speaking for them. She can say that she's not, she can say that's not of her intent, that that's exactly what she's doing. Uh, I don't know. I mean, obviously there are black people who are Marxists or who do say that that couch their terms, uh, their goals in terms of uh, e uh, equality. And then there are others who don't. And she's not speaking for them. She's speaking for herself. Let's see. So the next page. <laughs> the, and look, I, I read this and it made me think of some of my subscribers who are like white nationalists, who are white supremacists, right? So I've got some subscribers like that. I love those guys. They're great. You know, I just don't agree with them when it comes to that. But there are so many parts in this book where it it, it is explicitly it, like in terms of what it says and also in the in the spirit of what it says that it is actually white supremacist. So here we go. This is the kind of the first big um, glimpse of that. I am white and I'm addressing a common white dynamic. I am mainly writing to the white audience. When I use the term us and we, I am referring to the white collective. Another meta analysis of this book, she hates individualism and meritocracy. Those are the two kind of ideologies she hates the most. Um, neither one of which has a really definite, you know, political ideology. Obviously, libertarians usually consider themselves uh, uh, 
uh, individualist, but it, individual per se doesn't have its own philosophy. Neither does meritocracy. These are terms people use to describe. They're descriptors. They're not necessarily coherent ideologies of their own, but she hates both. Uh, and here she is saying that she's white. This is for white people. This is a book for white people. And this strikes anyone, you know, who grew up in the post- I have a dream speech, zeitgeist of the popular culture. This sounds incredibly racist, and I can't see how it's not. Um, in speaking as a white person to a primarily white audience, I am yet again centering white people and the white voice. Okay, so, but she doesn't have a problem speaking for black people. Specifically, there is some talk of people of color, but she makes it very clear that black people are on the top of her list. Um, Asians are apparently basically white adjacent. She doesn't really talk about Jews. I would love to ask her if Jews are white or not, uh, just to watch her squirm, because I don't know if she has an answer that she can make internally consistent with her uh, ideas here. But here we are. She's a progressive white woman, rich white lady, sensitive white lady, uh, and uh, she is using black people to be well, to make money. Uh, to have a career. She had a career as a diversity trainer up until, uh, she probably still does, but that's what kind of led to her becoming this author. Um, and she has no problem at all speaking for black people um, unless they're Uncle Tom's and she doesn't speak for them. You know, Uncle Tom's like Thomas Sowell. <laughs> um, uh, what about multiracial people? And though I believe for reasons explained in chapter one that temporarily suspending individuality to focus on group identity is healthy for white people. Doing so has some very some very different impacts on people of color. So here she says, it's, it's healthy for us to think of ourselves as a group identity of white people. Again, I, I, I read this and I thought immediately of some of my subscribers. You know who you are, broke microphone. Uh, I love you, guy, but like uh, we don't agree on that. But you would actually agree with D'Angelo on a lot of this. You would read this and be like, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Um, uh, like... And that's another interesting thing is the idea that, um, you know, words matter. If white people say them, they might hurt people of color. There's this idea that if uh, white people's racism is killing black people right now. And, of course, she always goes back to things like Emmett Till and slavery. So she's got to go back 60 years to start to, you know, give teeth to that. Um, or, or maybe someone like she just mentioned Trayvon Martin once or twice. That's funny. So that's a white Hispanic killing a black guy who's attacking him. But. You know, let's not go in there too much. Um, so there we go. White fragility. So that's just the forward. Hmm. Here we go. Page two, introduction. Uh, socialize into a deep internalized sense of superiority that we are, that we either are unaware of or can never admit to ourselves. We become highly fragile in conversations about race. So, you know, saying all white people have been socialized to have a, an internalized sense of superiority. So she's saying she has a sense of superiority vis-a-vis -vis, uh, black people. Sounds pretty racist. I don't know. Um, the mere suggestion that being white has meaning often triggers a rage of def defensive responses. So here again, if people disagree with her at all, she just says that's proof uh, that sh they are racist. That's just a proof. That's just a coping mechanism for them to hide their racism. You know, when they when they say that they're not racist and they list the reasons why, it really doesn't matter. You can say anything at all. You can be married to black people. You can help black people. You can be friends with black people. You can be as obviously not racist as possible, and she's just going to dismiss it. And like, this is just a defense mechanism to hide your racism. You're actually a white supremacist. We're all white supremacists. You're, all, you know, centering everything on whiteness, blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's see. I mean, she just got, she starts a chapter, personal reflections on my own racism. Yeah, if I, that's page four. If, however, I understand racism as a system into which I was socialized, I can receive feedback on my problematic racial patterns as a helpful way to support my learning and growth. 
So yeah, she also kind of feels it feels like she needs black people to you know help her with her racism by giving her crit criticism. She needs a lot of self criticism. And here we go. This is the this is the, if you disagree with me, then it just proves that I'm right. Yet when someone lets us know that we have just done such a thing, rather than respond with gratitude and relief, after all, now that we are informed, we won't do it again, we often respond with anger and denial. Such moments can be experienced as something valuable, even if temporarily painful, only after we accept that racism is unavoidable and that it's impossible to completely escape having developed problematic racial assumptions and behaviors. So I think she honestly thinks when people argue with her that they're just resisting the truth, that they know that she's right. And when people disagree with her, that's also evidence that she's right, that there's no, there's no alternative. This really is kind of a, uh, uh, an appeal to omniscience on her part. She really believes that there's no pragmatism here. There's no self-reflection. There's no, I might be wrong about this critical race theories might be wrong about something no they're the only people who are right everybody else is wrong on everything everybody else what was said scientists economists politicians regular people they're all wrong except for critical race theories the entire canon of western society is foundationally based on white supremacy that's explicitly what she believes uh, and so everything you know every university every every scientific study all knowledge, math, whatever, it's all tainted but with white supremacy and racism, so it's all wrong, except for critical theorists who are always right and who are uh, unquestionably sources that you can refer to deferentially, as she does many times. Um, this book is intended for us, for white progressives who so often, despite our c conscious intentions, make life so difficult for people of color. Well, I could probably agree with that, you know, broken clock and all that stuff. Uh, I believe that white progressives cause the most daily damage to people of color. It's on page five. Well, I agree with her there, probably. Uh, well, you know, every group does more damage to itself, so I'm sure black people more do more damage to themselves than white progressives do. But white progressives, you know, number number two, maybe. Um, this is interesting, too. This book does not attempt to provide a solution to racism, nor does it attempt to prove that racism exists. I start from that premise. Well, you know, I know this is going to sound like Western fucking science and it's tainted by white supremacy, but you can't just start from a premise. I can just start from the premise that elves are responsible for everything. We're just assume that all problems, that racism, that all poverty, that all uh, woe in the world is caused by invisible elves. They're just invisible and there's no evidence that they exist. And there's no way to prove them. And they have tainted society so much that all the evidence that says that elves don't exist or that they have a marginal existence, that's all tainted by elvish, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, influence. And so all of that is discounted. And the fact that we have scientists saying there's no such thing as elves and evolutionary biologists saying there's no such thing as elves and where are the fossils and all that doesn't really matter because all that science was itself tainted by elves. And so elves are behind everything. Like you can't just start from a premise. If you're trying to be persuasive about something, if you're trying to be persuasive about something, you can't just assume it in the argument. I mean, at some point, we can have some assumptions that aren't the premise, right? That, you know, reality is real or things like that, just to have the argument so we just don't deconstruct everything immediately, which is what, how critical race theory even, you know, that's that's its tactic. But no, we can't just start from, and also, if, if there is no solution to racism, what the fuck are we talking about? You know, it's, it's like the people who argue for reparations who say it's impossible to pay back. It doesn't matter if if all the wealth of the United States was given to black people right now. If every single white person, every single person who wasn't black surrendered all of their property, all of their wealth, everything, and even became slaves themselves, and that still wouldn't, you know, fix the problem, so so-called, then what are we talking about? Right? And that is what people like Ibram Kendi and ta Coates say. Right, that that it's eternal, that it will never end, that there's no way you can pay it back. Okay, then what are we talking about? It can't be undone. If racism can't be undone, why are we writing this book? Why are you giving lectures? If if racism can't be fixed, what the fuck are you doing? Making a career, you know, pissing people off and making everything demonstrably worse. So that's the introduction. Now I'm in chapter one. Guys, this can, might end up being a long video. I'm sorry, guys. Um. I'm a white American raised in the United States. I have a white frame of reference and a white worldview. And I move through the world with a white experience. My experience is not a universal human experience. 
it is a particularly white experience in a society in which race matters profoundly, a society that is deeply separated and unequal by race. Okay. So just, I mean, explicitly admitting that she's racist. And look, I, any white supremacist I know could read that and be like, yeah, I agree. Good job. <laughs> it's so funny. It's just, it's the irony is I can't emphasize it enough and still never gets old. Um, Exploring these cultural frameworks can be particularly challenging in Western culture pre precisely because of two key Western ideologies, uh, individualism and objectivity. So objectivity is a Western idea, right? So anytime you try and be objective, you're just being a Western. And individualism, right? Individualism obviously doesn't exist anywhere except among white people. Uh, and it doesn't really matter if it's true or not. It all that matters is that it's white and so it's therefore racist and wrong right it doesn't it does not matter if it's true it matters that it's white and then therefore it is wrong yeah dude i i, I used an entire pencil guys just circling stuff racism and white supremacy chapter two the difference we see with our eyes differences such as hair texture and eye color are superficial and emerged as adaptations to geography under the skin there is no true biological race the external characteristics that we are used to define race are unreliable indicators of genetic variation between any two people so at one level i agree with this because what you are going to call a certain race right you're going to categorize people there's a certain arbitrariness to that but to say there's no nothing genetic is also wrong uh, like black people have more sickle cell anemia in the United States, for instance, right? There, there are things that are genetically different. Uh, now, again, where you draw the lines can be arbitrary. This is the problem I have with the, the, a lot of the race realists, you know, so who, how, how genetically similar is somebody to be in my Volk, you know, my kin group? Because there's people, you know, obviously my immediate family, my nuclear family, my extended family, their extended family. And then we start going farther and farther, and it's like, does the circle include, you know, just to say, all Englishmen? Does it include French people? Does it include Polish people? Does it include, you know, and, and to say, well, they're more similar to me than a, a pygmy in sub-Saharan Africa. Yes, they are, but where do you draw the line? A, a Han Chinese person is more genetically similar to me than a pygmy in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, a, a Khoisan bush person in the Kalahari. So... Where, you know, where we draw the line can kind of be arbitrary, but to say that there's no genetic difference, that genetics only is on the skin, that's wrong, okay? So, no, that is wrong. That, and now, and we can say science here, but it doesn't matter that we say science here. It completely doesn't matter because science is Western and science is tainted by white supremacy. So is, by the way, printing books. That's Western, you know, like like the Gutenberg Bible, right? Like the, the like printing, that's Western. So I mean, Ibram Kendi, why don't you fucking write your books on papyrus or something? I, I like, I, and they're also all fucking Marxist, which is white as well. You know, so that didn't originate from Africa. So there's no there's no ideology here that comes from Africa. I mean, Ibram Kendi can put an X in front of his name. It doesn't change the fact that he's totally Westernized. Uh, Marxist. So this is just utterly wrong. This completely it's just like Dyson saying skin color is not heritable. Skin color is not heritable. And they're going to bring up like albinos and be like, well, white black people can have white skin if their son is an albino. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. That's not reaching at all. Uh, so here we go. Uh, it took her a while to actually define racism, but like when a racial group's collective prejudice is backed by the power of legal authority and institutional control, it is transformed into racism, a far-reaching system that functions independently from the intentions or self-images of the individual actors. So again, this is the whole prejudice plus power. But again, what are the institutional barriers now? There are no things that say, well, if you're white, if you're black, then you get a different legal authority. This did exist. This was something that did exist, doesn't exist anymore. Um, and also, uh, again, she doesn't talk about what about in, in China now or Japan now or Uganda or Tanzania. 
I mean, those those are countries that genocides have been Rwanda, right? Genocides have been done. Uh, and I think like, so the Rwandan genocide too, uh, you know, the Tutsis had been in control for a long time. They may have still been in control and the Hutus wiped them out. So we would say that's not racist because the Hutus were not in power, right? That doesn't make, that seems totally stupid to me. Like, where does she fall on that, by the way? I'd love to get her thoughts on the Rwandan genocide. I'm sure that that would end up being white people's fault. Um, similarly, racism, like sexism and other forms of oppression, occurs when a racial group's prejudice is backed by legal authority and institutional control. So again, it's prejudice if a minority does it, it's racism if a white person does it, and uh, she doesn't really have to show. Here, and here's the other thing is, well, where's the evidence? Because we have this big thing. There aren't equal outcomes, right? If you look at different groups, you just have different things. And then the question then becomes, well, the differences must be racism. Well, that is just an assumption. Like, <clears throat> I would love to ask, are there other variables out there that maybe can influence where groups end up, where individuals end up besides racism? Because the argument of this book is predicated at the answer to that question is no. The only thing that it describes anything is racism. It's not possible for it to be anything else. But, you know, someone like Thomas Sowell, point out you know if you have two groups he pointed out japanese and puerto rican americans and you could say well japanese people are much wealthier uh, per capita than puerto rican americans and he said well it must be racism against puerto ricans but not against japanese but he pointed out the average age the average age of a japanese american was 20 years older than the average age of a puerto rican american at a certain period i don't know if this is true today but at one point it was well you, that means that they're going to be richer right? Because they've had 20 more years on average to accumulate wealth, regardless of any other cultural differences or geographical differences, right? Or, or another thing, you know, let's say the majority of black people in the States live in the South. And then you say, well, you know, hurricanes disproportionately hurt black people because they live in hurricane areas. It Would that be racism, right? And so the thing is, any differences described is attributed to racism, but it gets to a point where that is the only explanation for anything. So I would love to know, are there other things that can adjust where people go? Coleman Hughes points out things like, you know, average African Americans, they spend a lot more of their money on, on, on luxury goods, nice cars, jewelry, like significantly more, like they invest a lot of their income into things like watches and necklaces, rings, you know, bling, and having nice cars that they really can't afford. How is that racism's fault? And of course, you can always do this redux and always go back and be like, well, they were socialized and colonized in the brain. But you're just making that shit up as you go. You don't have any actual evidence for that. You don't even need evidence for that, right? It's a, it's a faith, an article of faith. You don't need evidence. So, boop, boop, boop. Whites hold the, so whites hold the social and institutional positions in society to infuse their racial prejudice into the laws, politics, practices, and norms of a society in a way that people of color do not. A person of color may refuse to wait on me if I enter a shop, but people of color cannot pass legislation that prohibits me and everyone like me from buying a home in certain neighborhoods. What law are we talking about there? What law prevents, is there a law that says that black people can't buy houses in certain places? There's actually laws that say you can't do that. And black people do have political power. They've not only been the president, but they've run many municipalities, many governorships. There are many cities that are in their... I mean, large cities that are in their multi-decade, fifth, sixth decade of black rule. So that's just a myth. I mean, you're just making shit up. Now, it is the smaller population. So the idea that um, the, a minority of blacks are going to rule a majority of rights, uh, whites, that seems very unlikely to happen uh, if there's any kind of parity between them. And uh, so I don't know what she would want. We've had a black president you know, which he addresses is basically being meaningless. Um, yeah. Yet racial disparity between whites and people of color continues to exist in every institution across society. And in many cases is increasing rather than decreasing. I don't know if that's true with everything, but let's just assume that it is for the sake of argument. Again, is, is racism the only explanation that po could possibly exist for that reason? Are there not possibly other things that could cause that? And the other, the other thing is, it really does rob black people of having any agency whatsoever. They are completely helpless pawns. They're completely helpless victims to uh, white supremacy, to racism. 
They absolutely have no control over their lives whatsoever. All the agency is with white people. It, white people control everything. White people are, the, are, are superior. White people have all the power, all the influence, everything. And black people are just helpless pawns who can't do anything about it. I mean, so the, the, there is no, there's nothing here. It's only racism. Racism is the only thing that causes, there's no other, it's not even, and, and you could even say, well, racism is the biggest reason, sure. But are there other things that contribute even a little bit? No, the answer is no. They're, they're like, it's only racism. She considers whiteness a form of property. Whiteness is a position of status. White history is implied by the absence of its acknowledgement. So the fact that people don't talk about white history, white history month, white supremacy, the fact that they never talk about it explicitly proves that it's real. All right. It's either the, the elves again. The fact that people don't talk about the elves and they never mention the elves and the elves are strangely absent and they only kind of show up in fiction every now and then that proves that the elves are just that deeply ingra ingrained into society that it's take they're not acknowledged yeah elvish history is implied in, in the absence of its acknowledgement you could just say anything there not white history you could say anything there right the crab people's history is implied by the absence of its acknowledgement absence of evidence is evidence right absence of evidence is evidence of of it existing right we turn SETI on its head. We don't hear any aliens. That means the aliens must exist. You know, we don't hear anything about white supremacy in the United States. Therefore, white supremacy must exist. This is a non-falsifiable statement. Boop, boop, boop. <laughs> so white supremacy. He's, she's recording a, 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 an author name um, in his book, The Racial Contract by Charles W. Mills. So that may be a good one to read at some point. Um, he notes that although white supremacy has shaped Western political thought for hundreds of years, it is never named. All right. So it's never named, but it's completely ubiquitous, overpowering. It's the defining thing. It defines everything. It's just never named. <laughs> In fact, much of white supremacy's power is drawn from its invisibility. So the lack of evidence is evidence of its power. Right, again, with the elves. The elves run everything. Tolkien was right. Yeah, boop, boop, boop. We've got 100 pages to go still, people. Racism after the Civil Rights Movement. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is a there are lots of gems in here there's lots of like double takes you got to go over me like wait she actually said that consider a conversation i had with a white friend she was telling me about a white couple she knew who had just moved to new orleans and bought a house for a mere twenty five thousand dollars of course she immediately added that they also had to buy a gun and joan is afraid to leave the house i immediately knew they had bought a house in a black neighborhood so it's interesting, too, because she denies that there's any kind of criminal differences, you know, crime, that there's no violent crime distinctions between black and white. She just straight up denies it. Um, but she also knows it, though, like, and she talks about that here. But I immediately knew they had bought a home in a black neighborhood. <laughs> okay. Um, readers may be asking themselves, but if the neighborhood is really dangerous, why is acknowledging this danger a sign of racism? Research is implicit. Research and implicit bias has shown that perceptions of criminal activity are influenced by race. White people will perceive danger simply by the presence of black people. We cannot trust our perceptions when it comes to race and crime. Ah, okay. So um, that may be true. It's possible that somebody could say they feel like they're in a high crime area because they see a lot of black people. And actually, maybe that area doesn't have high crime. And those places definitely exist. There's places with lots of black people where the crime is very low. However, there are places where there's lots of black people and the crime is very high. And in fact, the places in the United States that have the highest homicide rates usually have a very high proportion of black people in them. It's not all black people. It's a subset of a subset. Uh, but she's going to completely ignore that because we cannot trust our perceptions when it comes to race and crime. It's not just our perceptions. She's taught, she, we can't trust empirical data on this um, because it's racist. 
There were, there were times where I was marking more than others. Sometimes I just wanted to read and, you know, but I, I literally had a pencil in hand the entire time I read this. Um, this is a really famous line. I heard, I've heard Lindsay, Lindsay describe this is on page 53. Um, what does white, what does white rage shape the lives of white people? How does white rage shape the lives of white people? Uh, I was invited to a retirement party of a white friend. The party was a potluck picnic held in a public park. As I walked down the slope toward the picnic shelters, I noticed two parties going on side by side. One gathering was primarily composed of white people. The other appeared to be all black people. I experienced a sense of disequilibrium as I approached and had to choose which party was my friend's. I felt a mild sense of anxiety as I considered that I might have to enter the all black group and then mild relief when I realized that my friend was in the other group. Sounds like she doesn't like black people. And that sounds like racism, like actual racism, not invisible elf racism. That sounds like actual racism. Like, and, and that's another thing is she talks about that type, the type of racism she's describing among herself right here. She talks about that, and then she talks about just the general, the system that everyone goes, and then she conflates the two, so they mean the same thing. So there is no difference in her mind between somebody who, you know, maybe uh, uh, doesn't believe in affirmative, in, in affirmative action or um, uh, didn't vote for Obama and somebody who's in the Klan. They're both equally racist, and so she is equally racist with those, you know, fucking people wearing hoods. And, I mean, given how much she probably supports Democrats, it would make sense that she'd be racist. Um, Indeed, throughout my life, I've been warned that I should avoid situations in which I might be a racial minority. These situations are often presented as scary, dangerous, or, quote, sketchy, quote, Yet if the environment or situation is viewed as good, nice, or valuable, I am confident that as a white person, I shall be racially, I shall be seen as racially belonging there. So white is good, nice, and valuable. Black is sketchy, scary, dangerous. That's what she was taught. Where did she grow up? America. Here she is making racist assumptions. I have made this assumption myself when I have been unable to hide my surprise that the black man in, is the school principal or when I ask a Latinx woman kneeling in a garden if this was her home. Are you the help? Da, da, da. Sorry, guys, I do want to get through all the quotes, so I'm kind of thumbing through. For those of us who work to raise the racial consciousness of whites, simply getting whites to acknowledge that our race gives us advantages is a major effort. The defensiveness, denial, and resistance are deep, but acknowledging advance, advantage is, the, is only the first step. So, again, if you disagree with me, it's because I'm right. right? It's not because you actually found a flaw with my argument or you actually disagree. It's because I'm right and you're wrong. The only explanation for disagreement is uh, is a secret acknowledgement of my correctness. This, this is like, you know, I'm, I'm a libertarian. I'm, I'm an anarchist. I believe in free markets, capitalism, all that stuff. And anytime someone disagrees with me, which is very often, right, that's not the most popular fucking opinion in the world, and I'm used to people not agreeing with me, I don't go. Well, the reason you're a socialist or the reason you don't favor free markets is because you actually know that they're better and you just are afraid to admit it. I... There might be cases where that is true, but I think that's actually very, very rare. Okay, Most of the people who disagree with me honestly believe that I'm wrong, and they honestly believe what they believe. I think that they're wrong, and I think I can articulate why, and I can show evidence why, whether it's logical evidence or empirical evidence or both, theoretical arguments. Right? I don't just assume they are in denial of the truth. They know the truth, and they are just in denial of it. No, that's not the way I go about doing it. Um, you know, maybe her way is a better way in the sense that it can just browbeat somebody, but it's not actually persuasive. Da, 
do, do, do. My psychological development was inculcated in a white supremacist culture in which I am the superior group. I'm in the superior group. Telling me to treat everyone the same is not enough to override this socialization, nor is it humanly possible. What are we doing? What are you doing if it's not humanly possible and that you are in the superior group no matter what, and this will never change? Are you just trying to make a buck off of the suffering of black people? You know, so more wealth can be transferred to a, a rich white woman who won't change a thing. Right? Who speaks for all black people and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, making racism bad seems to be like a positive change. And so this is she points out, like, so up to the civil rights movement, being racism was respectable. After the civil rights movement, you know, being racist became bad. But this did not change the amount of racism in the country at all, from her perspective. Making racism bad seems like a positive change. We have to look at how this functions in practice. Within this paradigm, to suggest that I am racist is to deliver a deep moral blow, a kind of character assassination. I think she knows that. Um, having received this blow, I must defend my character, and that is where all my energy will go to deflecting the charge rather than reflecting on my behavior. Again, so if someone denies the charge, it's it, obviously the charge is right. Like if you tell someone that they're racist or they have implicit bias or whatever else, then that charge is just automatically true, and they should just accept that and, uh, you know, uh, feel bad about it and uh, publicly exclaim, you know, their, their wrongdoing. Uh, and if they, if they dispute the uh, allegation against them, then that uh, is the wrong thing for them to do. Um, my identity, personality, interest, and investment will develop from a white perspective. I will have a white worldview and a white frame of reference in a society in which race clearly matters. Our race profoundly shapes us. This is where I just hear a broke microphone typing this and leaving a comment. I, and I don't mean to, I'm sorry, I don't want to pick on you, but you're the one that comes to mind. Um, like, okay, okay. This this book drives me to be a white nationalist, right? This book makes me think, well, it doesn't sound like I have an option here. I've got, I can't be an individualist. Apparently that's completely wrong. And uh, white people, you know, it's just something that's already there and it's completely unavoidable, right? Um, the, now it's interesting they're very adamant that um, it's not a biological thing that, that racism exists. That can't be. It's just a foundational cultural thing. But if you talk about culture at all, then they don't agree with that, right? If, so white racism is, is a cultural social thing that's impossible to escape, but then um, black culture is, has no influence whatsoever. It can't possibly be an explanation for you know, why they buy jewelry or commit homicides at whatever rate, twice, three times the rate of, of white people. Um, yeah, so there's this denial of genetics and then this emphasis on culture, but only for white people. Okay, then a white teacher was just talking about she would do all these, she has all this experience, you know, uh, giving diversity training to various, you know, so she draws, she draws anecdotes from that experience probably in pretty much every chapter. So she's drawing such an anecdote, anecdote here. Then a white teacher raised her hand and told a story about an interaction she had as she drove alongside a group of parents, parent protesters protesting the achievement gap in her school. She then proceeded to imitate one of the mother, one mother in particular who offended her. You don't understand our children, this mother had called out of her called out to her as she drove by by the stereotypical way that the white teacher imitated the mother all we knew we all knew that the mother was black the room seemed to collectively hold its breath at her imitation which was bordering on racial mockery while well, the teacher's concluding point was that on reflection she came to the realization that the mother was right and that she really didn't understand the children of color the emotional thrust of the story was her umbrage at the mother for making this assumption for the room, the emotional impact was on her stereotypical imitation of an angry black woman. So this is what I don't find interesting. I find this interesting as well. Any type of character, like if you if you imitate if you imitate a black person, that is a serious that's that's problematic behavior, right? That's that's politically incorrect. That's uh, highly questionable. That's racist, right? If you imitate a black person, but if you 
but, but but she's also telling us we have to be very aware that they're black and we're white and that they're different and that we're we're different and that there's all these differences and also they shouldn't act white we shouldn't enforce them to act white so if i'm going to quote a black person should i should i change the way that they talk should i edit the way that they talk to sound white or should i do it accurately to convey that they're black right and let's say we could either do this with an accurate imitation, say we just copy their inflections and wording precisely, or it's not precise, but you get the gist that they're black. I don't know. This is like a heads I win, tails you lose kind of situation. Are, is she not allowed to, are, are white people just not allowed to quote black people at all because doing so uh, could reflect her umbrage? <laughs> Or, or, or just be mo racially mockery, right? Are you not allowed to do that? I don't understand. Are, are, like, we're supposed to be aware of the differences. We're supposed to notice them constantly and be kind of center our existence on, on that awareness, but we can't discuss it explicitly. Um, so I don't know what, what are we supposed to do? Is she not, was she not, if, if she apparently accurately conveyed that the one woman who, you know, scolded her was black. So what was the problem? Well, the problem was, you tell us that we have to be aware of, con you tell us constantly that we have to be aware of their race, that their race is important, that it's super important, that we should acknowledge it constantly, we should be aware of it constantly. And then when we, when we do that, then all of a sudden that in and of itself is a problem. This, this, so then they start telling her that she's racist, blah, 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 for imitating a black person. Um, when she immediately began to protest, I interrupted her and con to continue. I am offering you a teachable moment, I said, and I am only asking you to listen with openness. That's really fucking mendacious. That's like this attitude. I just want to fucking smack this bitch. Like when I read stuff like that, I can't like the that degree of fucking moral superiority from this piece of shit motherfucker. It's just revolting. And again, I'm just trying to help you. I'm offering you a teachable moment and you have to take it. The same story could easily be told with the same conclusion drawn without racially charged imitation of the mother. But you say everything is racially charged. Everything is racially charged and we need to be aware of that. And what, 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 how could she not racially charge it? She's she'll she's gonna uh, repeat the words of this mother, but she's gonna repeat them in a white voice. But that's not the voice that the woman spoke with. So are we supposed to not edit black voices to sound like white voices because it's a racial stereotype? If we accurately re like re reproduce them, that doesn't make any sense. Are, are we are we supposed to edit? And change black voices to sound like white voices because if we if if a white person sounds like a black person then that in and of itself is 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 highly problematic right it's a teachable moment mm. we can be told and often are told to treat everybody the same but we cannot successfully be taught to do so because human beings are not objective unless they're ra critical race theorists, then they are objective, right? Further, we wouldn't want to treat everyone the same because people have different needs and different relationships to us. And I actually started this one and said, what the fuck? Okay, so here's the problem here. You're saying the whole basis, the whole basis, the entire evidence here. I mean, it, she just assumes racism, right? She says we're not going to even debate that. So, you know, not a good argument, but um, is that, Look, there's differences. There's differences. These differences must be because of racism. But here she says, we wouldn't want to treat everyone the same because people have different needs and different relationships with us. People are different. People are different. People are different. And so to assume that we have exactly identical statistics for everybody is fucking stupid. It's wrong. And then to say, well, any difference must be because of prejudice, right? It must be, right? And, you know, the, the irony here would be the police must be incredibly sexist against men because 98% of the people they kill are men. Why aren't they killing women? Why do they only kill 2 to 4% women? That doesn't make any sense. That must be because of sexism against men by the police. 
if that doesn't sound fucking stupid to you, I don't know what to do for you. Like, and so, but the entire argument is, well, it must be like, we don't, we don't find a racist policy. We don't find a racist law. We don't find an explicitly racist action. We just see a disparity in outcome. And well, that proves that there must be something wrong and that something must be racism. It couldn't possibly be anything else, right? There's no other forces in society. There's no other variables. It's really like society is not really complex. It's not complex at all. The only variable is racism. That's the only variable. That's the constant thing. It never leaves. It's always part of Western society. Again, she ignores, you know, there's other societies that are hegemonic and have minorities that are not white dominated, you know, basically all of them, right? Every society you can find that doesn't have a white ruling elite, they have minorities that are not part of their group that live there. So they could all be racist too, but she has nothing to say about any of that. Uh, but yeah, this was like, wait a second, people are different? I, but you, but your whole premise of the argument is that people are the same and they, they should have identical outcomes. And the fact that they don't proves not only that there's something wrong, but that something must be racism. We don't want to treat everyone the same. I think this is like a boon because she's getting ready to you know do reverse racism. So she's going through arguments that people make to say that they're not racist. I marched in the 60s. My parents are not racist. I'm married to a you know person of color. So this is when I was a minority at my school, so I know what it means to experience racism. This claim defines racism as a fluid dynamic that changes directions according to each group ratio in a given space. That is what you define it as, right? Racism isn't like a... a, a a stereotypical or automatic denigration of a group. It's, uh, if you have power, right, it's the circumstances of that opinion. Um, it's fucking ironic. This, this distinction is not meant to minimize the white person's experience, but to aim to clarify and to prevent rendering the terms interchangeable and thus meaningless. As if the entire premise of this book was to not do that to the term racism itself, which it already has. It has changed to interchangeable, burning a cross in someone's front yard and then lynching the people in that family. That's racism. And so is imitating a black woman in speech. Right? They're both racist. They're interchangeably and meaningless at this point. Uh, my parents were not racist. They taught me not to be racist. A racism-free upbringing is not possible because racism is a social system embedded in the culture and its institutions. What are we doing here? It means everybody's racist. Everybody. We don't want to render terms interchangeable and thus meaningless, but also racism is everywhere all the time, no matter what, every single thing, every single thought, every single action. There is no, nothing that's not racist. Everything is racist. Everything is racist. Racism is a social system embedded in the culture and its institutions from the from the beginning. So I don't know where they draw the beginning either, because like obviously Western culture goes back before, you know, the North Atlantic slave trade by quite a quite a ways. Um, you know, the the role of Christian thought, for instance, Christian thought doesn't seem to be particularly racist. In fact, it's quite explicitly universalist. But, uh, and that had a big, 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 big influence on Western thought. And no mention of that here. The analysis doesn't really include that. It doesn't really fit the narrative, so we're not going to go there. <sighs> Race has nothing to do with it. We bring our racial histories with us. And contra contrary to the ideology of individualism, we represent our groups and those who have come before us. Speak for yourself. I don't like... I'm white. I have white ancestors. I don't, you know, like I, I, I had an uncle who died in World War II. Does that mean I know what it's like to be in World War II? Like he was in Normandy. He got killed. You know, doesn't sound like it was very fun. And I, I know a good friend of his who's 90, 98 years old. And, you know, he probably knows what that's like. And we're both white, but like, and that's my blood. Like it's literally my family. And his experience is not my experience. I've never been to France. I've certainly never been in a war. I've certainly never been in World War II. And the fact that he was doesn't mean shit. The fact that I had ancestors who were farmers, right? Most of my ancestors were farmers like everybody's were. Not a farmer, okay? 
I'm not a farmer. I'm not even a gardener. And I don't carry that in me. You could say, well, I have the genes that if they could do it, I could do it. Sure, whatever. We can survive an ice age because we know that we did it. But like, I haven't done it. I'm not a hunter-gatherer, blah, blah, blah. This is stupid. I remember in college, I I went to the riots because the, 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 the basketball team went to the Final Four and there were always riots. And uh, I asked this girl if she had, you know, this African-American girl, if she had gone. She goes, no, my people already know what that's like. And I'm like, your people, have you ever been to riots? She's like, no. And I'm like, then I don't, it doesn't make any sense to me. Of course, that's the ideology of individualism, which is obviously wrong. Right, the two this individualism and meritocracy are the two things she hates the most. Boop, boop, boop. Anti blackness. <laughs> She's got so many gems like this. But on a macro level, I recognize the deep anti black feelings that have been inculcated in me since childhood. These feelings surface immediately, in fact, before I can even think when I conceptualize black people in general. Racial triggers for white people. So I got to go through every page because I marked so many. Despite its ubiquity, white supremacy is also unnamed and denied by most whites. Like elves. No physical violence has ever occurred in any interracial discussion or training that I am aware of. The self-defense claims work on multiple levels. This is the other thing I want to I want to bring up. Uh, it's this complete dismissal of all reason, all evidence, all logic, all theories. All of that's wrong, but critical race theory is right. So, but why aren't they also par- products of a racist culture? Aren't they also inculcated in white supremacy? How, how are they able to see past it and not, not, no one else can, even when they talk about stuff that ostensibly has nothing to do with race? Well, the thing is, everything has everything to do with race. Race is a social contract, construct that controls everything at every level. Every level from babies. He talks about it like, as babies. And, and, but it's got to be social. Like They absolutely are blank slaters, right? This is Rousseau, Marx, Leonard Skinner, um, uh, all the way through that we're all blank slates. So all this, it's got to be socialization. There can't be anything biological in any of this, even though she talks about two and three year olds having racial biases that are, are unspoken, right? White supremacy is, is unnamed and denied. They're not inculcating their kids explicitly. It's just happening. They couldn't possibly be, be biological. Uh, let's see. The language of violence that many whites use to describe anti-racist endeavors is not without significance. It's another example of how white fragility distorts reality. Who's distorting reality here? Let me be clear about the term white fragility. It is intended to describe a very specific white phenomenon. White fragility is a much more than mere defensiveness or whining. It may be conceptualized as the sociology of dominance, an outcome of white people's socialization into white supremacy and a means to protect, maintain, and reproduce white supremacy. The term is not applicable to other groups who may register complaints or otherwise be deemed difficult, i.e. student fragility. White fragility is a form of bullying. She would be the expert on bullying now, wouldn't she? All whites are invested and collude in racism.
Almost there, people. Almost done. Given that the goal of anti-racist work is to identify and challenge racism and the misinformation that supports it, all perspectives are not equally valid. Some are rooted in racist ideology and need to be uncovered and challenged. What well, says all of them are, I mean, it's endemic to the complete society. Every The Western society is completely racist, always has been. It's founded on it. That's its bedrock. That's what it's based on. It's everywhere from three-year-olds to graduate students to professors to books to religion to politics to economics to everything. It's all encompassing all, all. It's ubiquitous. It's everywhere except in critical race theory, then it's fine. But then we have a critical race theorist right here who is admittedly super fucking racist. So maybe we should maybe assume that there's racism there too. What if someone, uh, this is good. This is good if you ever have to debate this woman or somebody like her, because she kind of gives away her own weaknesses quite explicitly. But what if someone does literally point a finger and boldly say, you are racist? This actually, this, this accusation is a deep fear for progressive whites. It is still on me to identify my racist patterns and work to change them. If the point being made is aimed at that goal, then regardless of how careful or indirectly it is being made, I need to focus on the overall point. The method of delivery cannot be used to delegitimize what is being illuminated or as an excuse for disengagement. So this is what I would say. If you ever get a chance to ask this piece of shit a question, I would ask her how many black men she's had sex with. Okay, I would say, Robin D'Angelo, you are a white progressive woman. You shed a lot of white woman tears. How many black men have you had sex with? And if she says that that's none of your business, you can say, people of color, women of color, were put on slave auction box, and they had no privacy, their sexual... Every sexual aspect, every sexual detail was put on display for public consumption and they could not hide behind their privacy. And your fucking white tears of a white woman is a sign of privilege. You're privileged that you can say that you're not going to spend, you're not going to open up about your details. So why don't you tell us how many fucking black men you've had sex with? And guess what? Any answer she gives is wrong because she says she's never done it. That's because she's racist and she's not attracted to black men and she has such a deep-seated white racism that she avoids men of color, black men in, in particular. And if she says, yes, she has, then she's fetishizing them and using them as, uh, as a sexual totem. She's fe uh, reducing them into a sexist stereotype. She's taking advantage of them as a white woman who has power over them, blah, blah, blah. She can't give a right answer, so don't let her give a right answer. Fucking use her logic fucking against her. She is racist. She either had sex with black men, in which case she's basically raping them because they can't consent because she has all this institutional power over them, or she's not, in which case she is revolted by them physically and she has this... Uh, dislike of black people that's so deep that she will not surrender her body, which is the least that she could surrender after 400 years of slavery and oppression. That's the very least she could do is let one get off inside of her fucking dry ass bitch pussy. God damn it. That's what I would ask her, right? She can't win with her logic. She's going to use this against other people. She's made a career off of doing this to other people. So I think, you know, you make the bed you're going to lie in. She's asking for it literally. Yeah, that's what I would want to. Uh, that's what I would want to ask. How many black men has she fucked? And whatever answer she gives is the wrong answer. She can go to fucking hell, this bitch. As I have tried to show throughout this book, white people raised in Western society are conditioned into white supremacy, into a white supremacist worldview, because it is the bedrock of our society and its institutions. Except for critical theorists at the universities, who are also Marxists. Right. That's definitely not a Western thing. Um, crit like critical theory is from France, so obviously it's not Western at all. Uh, regardless of whether a parent told you that everyone was equal or the poster in the hall of your white suburban high school proclaimed the value of diversity or you have traveled abroad or you have or you have people of color in your workplace or family or ubiquitous socializing power or white supremacy cannot be avoided. The ubiquitous the ubiquitous socializing power of white supremacy cannot be avoided. The message circulate, 
The messages circulate 24 seven and have little or nothing to do with intentions, awareness, or agreement. Entering the conversation with this understanding is freeing because it allows us to focus on how rather than if our racism is manifest, like, you know, not sleeping with black men or sleeping with black men, for instance. Um, when we move beyond good, bad binary, we can become eager to identify our racist patterns because interrupting those patterns becomes the most important, becomes more important than managing how we look to others. Why is it important? It's not going to, you said it can't fix the problem. So you're just making yourself upset for no reason. Um, I repeat, stopping our racist patterns must be more important than working to convince others that we do not have them. We do have them, and people of color already know we have them. Our efforts to prove otherwise are not convincing. An honest accounting of these patterns is no small task given the power of right fragility and white solidarity, but it is necessary. Of course, not all black people would agree with that, but those black people are Uncle Tom, so who gives a fuck about them? Boo, boo, boo. White Woman's Tears, Chapter 11. I want to make her cry and then berate her for crying because that just seems like poetic justice. I'm gay, too, so white woman's tears don't really matter to me. I mean, women can cry. I, I mean, I'm immune from all that, thankfully. <laughs> like this. She, so she talks about white women crying, you know, as like a defense, making it about them. Like she, she insults some woman for being racist when she's obviously not. The woman cries, and then she's like, look, you're robbing the narrative. You're you're crying in front of Like white woman tears kill black people. And then she uses Emmett Till. Okay, what, Emmett Till, that horrible story. Oh, my God, 60 years ago. How often did that happen? And it was more than Emmett Till. I'm not going to say that's the only example, but uh, a couple hundred times, a couple thousand times, a hundred years in the past. Jesus. How many... Uh, how many white women have been raped by black men? How many how many white people have been killed by black people? Like shot up, straight up dead. How many black people have been killed by other black people? How many black women have been raped by black men? You give a fuck about those tears. When a, when a black woman cries about being raped by a black man, are you going to say, don't invalidate his fucking experience, his lived experience as a person of color? You know, blah, blah, blah. White men, of course, are also racially fragile, but I have not seen their fragility manifest itself in cross-racial discussions as actual crying. Their fragility most commonly shows up as varying forms of dominance and intimidation, including these. Control of the conversation, arrogant and disingenuous invalidation of racial inequality, simplistic and presumptuous proclamations of the answers. Playing the outrage of the victim... Uh, playing the outraged victim of reverse racism, accusations of the legendary race card being played. It's, it's the legendary race card. This whole book is, a, okay. Silence and withdrawal, hostile bio language, channel switching. The true opposition is class. Intellectualizing and distancing. Look, this is a, she's, this varying forms of dominance and intimidation, including intellectualizing and distancing. Quote, I recommend this book. That is a form of dominance and intimidation. Really. But if you saw someone they should recommend your book, White Fragility, that's not dominance and intimidation. Her entire career is based on the fear of labeling somebody a racist and ruining their life, socially, economically, in every way. But a person who recommends a book after an accusation of racism, they are showing forms of dominance and intimidation. Almost done. Almost done. A positive white identity. Those who promote this approach often suggest we develop this positive identity by reclaiming the cultural heritage that we lost during assimilation into whiteness for European ethnics. This would be like, I'm Slovakian or Irish or whatever. However, a positive white identity is an impossible goal. White identity is inherently racist. White people do not exist outside the system of white supremacy. So I don't understand if it is cultural, if it is cultural, contextual, and institutional, why is it inherently racist, right? 
it's like if, if if it's just cultural, then well, that's not easy to change, but that can change, so it's not inherent. If it's inherently racist, then it's biological, right? It's biological then. So it does it like the the inference is pretty in, uh, pretty much impossible to resist that whites are biologically bad. Whites are biologically the problem and blacks are definitely not the problem and there's definitely no biological difference like but i don't know if if it if white identity is inherently racist it's inherently racist let's say every single person reads her book and every single white person becomes a dedicated anti-racist and we have a hundred percent parody of everything and every 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 Everything is, you know, by according to population and blah, blah, blah. And there's not, there's no, there's nothing, there's not even a question of, I mean, it's terrible to say, well, there's a disparity, so it must be racism. But there, you can't even assert that because there is no disparity anywhere at any level. And there's nothing you can point to, but it wouldn't matter because we're inherently racist. We're inherently racist. Sounds really, really biological. Oh, wow, I missed this ab above quote. I am sometimes asked whether my work reinforces and takes advantage of white guilt, but I don't see my efforts to uncover how race shapes my life as a matter of guilt. I know. I know that because I was socialized as a white in a racist, racism-based society, I have a racist worldview, deep racial bias, racist patterns, and investment in the racist system that is elevated me. Still, I don't feel guilty about racism. Let me read that one again. I am sometimes asked whether my work reinforces and takes advantage of white guilt, but I don't see my efforts to uncover how race shapes my life as a matter of guilt. I know that because I was socialized as a white in a racism-based society, I have a racist worldview, deep racial bias, racist patterns, and investments in the racist system that has elevated me. Still, I don't feel guilty about racism. Bitch, just wear a hood for Christ's sakes. We get it. You're racist. Wear a hood. Run with it. Fuck. You're not going to, like, this crusade, you've said to yourself will never excul morally exculpate you from this system. It'll never change. Just fucking wear a hood. You don't like black people. We get it. You don't like black people. You don't want to meet them. You don't want them like they're, they, like, okay, fuck it. Marry Richard Spencer for Christ's sakes. And that is the end. So white fragility can't believe it. I have a friend from Cambridge say he read this and he thought that it was good. It tells you that not the smartest people go to those colleges. Um, he's a smart person, but this is this is ridiculous. There, there's no evidence here. She just, the, the central premises are all assumed, even though there's really good reasons to think that they shouldn't be assumed, right? Racism isn't the only factor in society, and so to just assert that any differences must be because of racism ignores that reality, uh, and everything kind of flows from there. Uh, there is this enormous double standard with all, all learning, knowledge, wisdom, all of that is uh, invalid, wrong, questionable, dismissible, because it's, you know, from a, a white supremacist culture, except for critical race theory. That's all completely right. When she quotes a critical race, she goes, so-and-so, a critical theorist, a critical race theorist, and then that person will have a series of assumptions that don't make any fucking sense and that need to be heavily backed up to be valid and they aren't but we don't need that because they're critical theorists so they don't really need evidence so uh it's i mean i think i the popularity of the book is it's short and it's easy and you can say hey i virtue signal because i read it but i think that it's very likely that she is actually like legitimately actually racist she's guilty about it and then she's projecting onto society around her in a way that's completely ridiculous. And it's so out there that I think a lot of white supremacists will actually agree with a lot of the stuff that she says. Because she's very, very centered on the white 
culture. She's she's a white person, and she centers herself as such, and as the savior of black people, who are tokens to her to amplify her moral exploitation. So anyway, uh, we'll see how the other ones go. Um, right now, like I said, I'm reading um, the income, the, the uh, what is it called? So I finished that last night. Now I'm reading The Impending Crisis of the South uh, by Rowan Hinton Helper. This is excellent. I've already read the first um, like chapter. This is amazing. This is a great antidote to that. This was written in 1857, and it's about how slavery is destroying the South, how slavery is not the source of wealth, but how slavery has retarded the development in every sense of the South uh, by a Southerner who is totally fucking racist himself, but doesn't give a fuck. He says slavery is ruined. This is just a contra counterpoint to the idea that our society is based on racism or whatever. Slavery was a huge detriment to our society, and we paid an enormous cost to get rid of it. Uh, and, you know, you could say rightfully so, whatever, that's a different debate. But uh, that's next, and then I'll probably do... I'll probably do How to Be an Anti-Racist after that. Uh, is that Kanahasi or... No, uh, Ibram Kendi's book it will probably be the next one after that. So, anyway, I hope you guys found this interesting. Let me know what you think. If you, if you guys have read the book, what are your thoughts? Um, and if you don't want to read the book and just use this instead, that's fine. Cause less money to her and that's, that's fine. Um, but yeah, I'll talk to you all later. Have a great day. Bye.